Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K-E-S-H-W-A-N-I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, GMAT Review, the, third, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. This book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. Right now we are in the middle of redoing the problem. But if you're interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 to 250. Right now we are on page number 100, uh, 283. Let's take a look at it. The very first problem we're going to do is number 93. Number 93. Number 93 says, does, does Club X have more people than does Club Y? Quite simple, straightforward question. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement they tell us that 20% of X belongs to Y. Now does that tell us, does that tell us, does that enable us to ascertain if one club has more members than the others? The answer of course is no. All we know is that 20% of X belong to Y. For example, for example if X happens to be 100, if X happens to be 100, then all we are told is that 20% of X belong to Y, which means that tells us, it tells us that 20 happens to be in the middle, this is 80, but we have no idea how many people belong only to club Y? First information, the first statement is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we've established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B, C or E. Let's take a look at second statement. Second statement tells us, the second statement tells us that 30% of y belongs to x. 30% of y belongs to us. Let's see what that tells us. Again, simply knowing that 30% of the people of y belong to x does not tell us exactly which club has more members because all we know from this part, all we know is that here's our x, here's our y, 30% of y belongs to x. So if we we're going to pretend that y is 100, if we're going to pretend that y is 100, then we know that 30 is the common here. Again, we do not know how many people belong only to X. And until we find out how many people belong only to X, we cannot tell which, which club of course has more members. Second statement by itself was also no good by itself. Answer cannot be B. Let's put them together, shall we? When we put the two statements together, then we're going to get some place. When we put them together, when we put them together, now we know that 20% of X, 0.2 of X equals 0.3 of Y. There you have it. There you have it, that if 20% of a number, if 20% of some number equals to 30% of some other number, then x has to be more than y, because it only takes 20% of x to equal 30% of y. Or we can continue doing it if you like, it's not necessary because you can continue. What this tells us is 2 over 10 x equals 3 over 10 y, which in turn implies that 2 x equals 3 y. Only 2 of x is equal 3 of y. That, imp that in turn implies that x must have must have 50% more. Even though this part was not necessary for us to do, this was a waste of time as a matter of fact. They're not asking us how many more people X has, what's the, what's the proportion here. The question simply is, does X have more people than Y? The answer is yes, it does have. We are able to say, give a definitive answer by putting the information from the two assessment together. The answer is C. The answer is C. Now if you wanted to show this scenario, if you wanted to show this scenario in a Venn diagram, that's also very straightforward. We just make up numbers here. Make up some numbers which is the multiple of 2 and 3. How about uh, we pretend that x is x is 300. Let's pretend that x is 300. If x is 300, 20% of x would be 60. That will go here. And 20 is 20, 60 is 20% 20 of what? If 20, uh, sorry, if 60 represents uh, rather 30% here. Let me start again. If we pretend that x is 300, 20% of 300, 10% of 300 is 30. 
and therefore 20% of 300 is going to be 60, it goes here. And that 60 also happens to be 30% of y. So if 60 is 30%, that tells us that 20 is 10%, which means y must be 200. And it works perfectly fine, you see? This is the scenario that we're dealing with, where 20% of x, x is 300 here, x could be any number, but this is one scenario here. x is 300 and 20% of 300 is 60, that's the common, that's the common element. And then y equals to 200, total, there are a total of y, uh, 200 people in club y, and so on and so forth. And we could finish it if you wanted to. Not in the real example, you understand? All of this thing is not necessary. So this is 60, and there are 120 people who belong to only a club y, and you subtract 60 from here, we get 240. And there are 240 people that belong to only club x, and 60 people belong to both of them. But that's a scenario, that's a scenario where 20% of one equals to 30% of the other. And of course, x is bigger. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number 94. Let's see what they have to say, number 94. In number 94 we are told that in a certain office we, have, we are told that 50% are college graduates. 50% of people are college graduate. We are further told that 60% of people are over 40. And they are going to tell us that they're going to tell us that 30% of those over 40 have master's degree. The question is how many how many over 40, how many over 40 have a master's degree? How many people over 40 have a master's degree given the fact that we have an office where 50% of the old people have, have college degrees? We are also told that 60% of the people in that office are over 40 years of age and all those people who are 40 years of age we are told that 30% of those have a master's degree. The question is exactly how many people have, how many people over 40 have a master's degree? Let's find out, shall we? Let's see what they tell us in the first statement. In the first statement they tell us that exactly exactly 100 college graduates exactly one, 100 college graduates are in the office. Well, if exactly 100 college graduates are office and we are told that 50% of the people in the office have college degree, that, in, that, that implies that we must have we must have 200 people total. Now we understand the part that we are doing here on the blackboard is very slow, it's at a leisurely pace and so forth. In the exam, of course, you have to think of this step quite rapidly in your mind. Do you understand? One does not take one's time to write everything down. That will be silly in the real exam. That'll be, that'll be, that, that will not be very smart. And then they go on to tell us that 60% of, 60 of, uh, 60 of these people are over 40. So we have 200 total people, 60% of them are over, over 40. 60% of 100 is 60, so 60% of 200 is 120. 120 are over 40. We are also told that 30% of those that are over 40 have college degree. We are done. We just have to figure out 30% of this amount and that will answer our question. How many people, how many people over 40, how many people over 40 have college degree? The answer is 30% of that amount. Answer is 30% of this amount. 130. I'm just going to write it, okay? 10% is 12, so 30% is going to be 36. It's just going to be 12 times 3 over 40 have a master's degree. Let's just call it Masters of Arts, okay? Because we are lazy. That's it. We are able to answer the question, how many people over 40, over the age of 40 in our office have a master's degree? The answer is 36 people. The first statement does the job quite nicely. The first statement does the job quite nicely. A D B C E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. We are done with this one. Let's move on to second statement. In the second statement they tell us, in the second statement they tell us that 25%, 25% of under 40 have Master's degree. 25% of 
under 40 have master's degree but this does not tell us at all how many people are over 40. We need to know how many people are over the age of 40. We have to somehow figure out how many people are over the age of 40 then and only then we can figure out how many people over the age of 40 have master's degree because the problem actually tells us that 30% of those who are over 40 have master's degree. In order to figure out 30% of those who are over 40 that have master's degree, we have to know how many people are over 40. This does not tell us. This, this tells us that 20% of people are under the age of 40. How many people are over the 40? We do not know. We do not know. 25% of under, under 40 have master's degree. That's it. They did, had they told us that 25% of the people in the office are under the age of 40, then of course we can figure out how many people are over the age of 40, but that's not what they're telling us. They're not telling us 25% of the people uh, are under the age of 40. They're telling us 25% of the people who are under the age of 40 have master's degree. This is not enough. This is not going to get us anywhere. This does not enable us to figure out how many people are over the age of 40. Second statement is not enough. The answer is A. If they had told us this part, 25% of people, 25%, 25% are, if they had told us this part, 25% are under 40, now that would have done the job. If 25% of people are under, under the age of 40, then 75% are over the age of 40, and then we can figure out how many people over the, over the age of 40 have master's degree, because they tell us that 30% of those people have master's degree. But that's not what it tells us. This is not what we're told. We're not told 25% of people are under 40, we are told that 25% of under 40 have master's degree. That doesn't do the job. Let's move on to the next one, number 95. In this scenario, the answer would have been D. In that scenario, the answer would have been D. Number 95. B, Q, R, S, and T. And we are told that these are five, these are five consecutive even integers. That makes our life very easy. Five consecutive even integers. Question is, what's their average? Question is, what's their average? Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, they tell us that Q plus S equals 24. Are they really? That can't be that simple. Q plus S equals 24. I just want to double check. I'm getting... That's exactly what they tell us. Actually, that's pretty straightforward. Look, here is our Q. Right here is our Q. And right here is our S. And because they are consecutive, because they are consecutive even integers, if they, since they are consecutive even integers, from Q to R, when we go from Q to R, it goes up by 2. In other words, in other words, R is Q plus 2. And S is Q plus 4. And we are told that their sum is 24. That's very simple. Q must be 10 and S must be 14. That's it. Q must be 10 and S must be 14. I left no room there. Let's do, let's do it here. P, Q, R, S, and T. So this tells us that this tells us that Q must be 10 and S must be 14. Oh, there you go. The question is, what is their average? Well, that's very, very straightforward. Of course, we can figure out the average. If this is 10, this guy's got to be 8. And if this is 14, this guy's got to be 16. In the middle, in the middle, we'll have 12, and that's our average. That's our average because because of the fact that the, because of the fact that they are evenly spaced, the one in the middle is the average. The first statement actually does the job quite nicely. This is actually a very straightforward question. A D B C E A D B C E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself does the job quite nicely, we know now that the answer cannot be B C or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that the average of Q and R, average of Q and R is 11. Okay, that, that's pretty straightforward also. Again, P, Q, R, S, and T. We are told that the average of Q and R is 11. Here's our Q. Here's our R, and their average is 11 right here. This is their average, which is the middle number. That's 11. Well, if the number that falls right in the middle is 11, then this guy must be 10, and this guy must be 12. That's it. We're done. Once we know this is 10, Q is 10, and R is 12, the rest is the same as before. If this is 10, this has got to be 8. 
this got to be 14 and this got to be 16, same as before. And now since they are again evenly spaced, the average of all of these five numbers is this guy. The average of all of these five numbers is R, which is 12. Second statement does the job quite nicely as well. The answer is? The answer is D. Let's move on then. Next one. Number 96. Number 96 is not a straightforward question. I'm warning you. Some of them require some thinking and the others are just, you know, silly questions. This was one of those silly questions. Number 96. Number 96 tells us that this symbol right here, oh, sorry, I made a mistake, you see? This symbol right here, let me, let me start. The symbol is like this, like this. And they put a number in there. That's the symbol. Listen, read carefully, okay? It denotes, it denotes least integer greater than or equal to x. Greater than or equal to x. Now listen, before we actually get going with the problem, before we get going with the problem, I'm, I'm going to make a little change here, just, just, just for our own sake, for, for our own facility, for our own convenience. When I first read this problem, I literally had to pick up my bloody magnifying glass to figure out that they are not talking about the absolute value. Because it looks, without the magnifying glass to my, to my eyes, perhaps I have too weak of an eyesight, it looked like to me uh, an absolute sign. It's not an absolute sign. There is, there, there is this part right here on the top and there is this part on the top. Let's make our life easier and let's change this symbol. The symbol that they're giving us is very annoying. Let's change this symbol to something else that's very easy to see. Shall we? Let's make up your own symbol. So I'm going to change this thing. Let's just finish the box. So for, for as, far as, I can, as far as we're concerned, if a number appears in the box in this problem, if we see a number in the box, then it denotes the least integer greater than or equal to x. Now let's, let's, find, out what, let's find out first what that actually means. Let's first understand. Let's, let's first make sure that we understand what that means before we actually begin to solve the problem, obviously. For example, for example, could you tell me if we see point 0.1 in a box, what would that equal to? In other words, in other words, what we are asking ourselves is, what's the smallest, least, you see, least. What's the smallest whole number, what's the smallest whole number, what's the smallest integer that you can think of that happens to be either equal to this or greater than that smallest integer that's either equal to it or greater than that. Smallest integer. In other words, the integer that comes closest to it. Well, that integer would of course be 1. Because if you have a number line here, here's our 0, here's our point 0.1, and here is 1. That is the smallest integer, that is the smallest integer, least integer, that happens to be, there is our, this, this is our x here, and this, this guy, 1, is greater than or equal to 0.1. 1 is greater than or equal to 0.1. That's the smallest integer that we can find. 2 wouldn't do the job. 2 is too far. We can't go on this side because negative 1 would have been less than x. Negative 1 would have been less than 0.1. It has to be greater than or equal to x. For ex let's do another example. For example, can you tell me what would be the value of this guy? 3 and 1 quarter. Think about it. What's the smallest integer that you can think of that's going to be greater than or equal to 3 and 1 quarter. Well, the smallest integer is 4. The least integer that meets this condition, 4, happens to be greater than or equal to 4. This quantity is greater than or equal to, obviously it's not greater than. That's what this symbol, this, is, this, this represents a whole number. This quantity, when it appears in the box, represents a whole number that's greater than or equal to the smallest integer. Well, the smallest integer is 4. 5 is too far away. Let's do one more. How about this one? 0 0.00000000. If it appears in a box, what's the smallest integer that you can think of that is going to be either equal to or greater than this number here? 0 0.00000001. Well, the answer is that's 1. This is same as that. These two, quantities, these two quantities are equal. Do you understand now? Let's do the problem. 
That's not a problem though. What exactly is the question asking? We have not figured out what they're asking actually. Number 96. I lost track of that. Number 96. Give me a second. Oh, question is, is this quantity equal to zero? Is this quantity that appears in the bar is a zero? Let's find out what they tell us. Well, the first statement tells us that x is between negative 1 and positive 1. x is between negative 1 and positive 1. Well, that tells us that tells us that x could be that tells us that x could be x could be between negative 1 and 0 or x could be between 0 and positive 1. In both scenarios, in both of these scenarios, we meet this condition. We are told, we are told that x is between negative 1 and positive 1. What we are doing is, we are taking this interval of negative 1 to positive 1 and break it up into, breaking it up into two parts. We are taking this interval from negative 1 to positive 1 and, and we are breaking it up into two intervals. One that goes from negative 1 to 0, from negative 1 to 0, and the other that goes from 0 to 1. And so let's see what happens. For example, for example, if x happens to be, for example, if x happens to be negative 3 quarter, negative 3 quarter falls in this range, negative 3 quarter falls between negative 1 and 0. If x happens to be negative 3 quarter, then the value of the x, if it appears in the box, that would mean the smallest integer, this represents the smallest least integer that happens to be greater than, greater than or equal to x. And that in fact would be 0. But, but if x happens to be if x happens to be one half or one ninth, let's do one half. Let's keep it simple. If x happens to be one one half, then the smallest value of one half, the small, smallest integer rather, the smallest integer that we can think of, that it has to be a whole number, the closest whole number that we can find to one half. That's what they're saying. The closest whole number that we can find to one half go on the other side, on the, on the positive side, not on the negative side, because it has to be greater than or equal to, it has to be greater than or equal to, and that's 1. So, the answer is, well, if x happens to be in this range, then it will be 0. The value of the x in the box would be 0. If x happens to be in this range, then the value of the, of the x in the box would be 1. Here, the value of the box the value of the x in the box is 1. Question is, is the value of the x in the box 0? Answer here would be, we don't know. It depends on where it falls. Does it fall between negative 1 and 0? Or does it fall between 0 and 1? If it falls between 0 and 1, then it's 1. But if it happens to fall between negative 1 and 0, then of course it would be 0. So had it been this scenario only, had they given us only this scenario, then the answer to, answer to this question would have been a definitive yes. Is the value of the x in the box 0? The answer is definitely. But if it happens to fall in that one, then, then that's no good. The first statement does not do the job. The first statement is not enough. The first statement is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. The first, now that we established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. Somehow we have to find out if it falls in this range from negative 1 to 0. Let's look at the second statement. Second statement tells us that x is negative. Again, simply knowing that x is negative is not enough. Simply knowing that x is negative is not enough at all. For example, for example, I didn't want to erase it, but we have to. For example, x could be x could be negative 100.01, in which case the value of the x in the box, the smallest integer that comes closest to it, that is the least integer that comes closer to it, that is greater than or equal to, that's equal to negative 100 in this case. But if x happens to be, if x happens to be negative 2, then the, in the box would simply be negative 2. If x happens to be, if x happens to be, 
negative point zero 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 one. You see, x is negative. We are told that x is negative. If x happens to be, if x happens to be point zero 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 one, then the smallest integer that we can find that comes closest to it is zero. So in this case, it is zero. But here, it's not. Simply knowing that x is negative is not enough. Second statement by itself does not do the job. Simply knowing that it is neg it is a negative number is not enough. Let's put them together, shall we? When we put them together, when we put the two statements together, now we know that the first statement, from the first statement we gather, from the first statement we gather that x is either x is either negative one between negative one and zero, or x is between zero and positive one. In this scenario, in this scenario, we found out that the value of the x in the box was going to be one. In this scenario, the value of the x in the box was zero. Now, when we put the two statements together, second statement tells us that x, whatever it is, is a negative quantity. Well, if x, whatever it is, is a negative quantity, then we have just ruled out, we have just ruled out this scenario. This scenario is gone. If x is negative quantity, then we're dealing with this scenario here, in which case the value of the x in the box will always be zero. So the question was, is the value of the x in the box zero? The answer is definitively yes, by putting the two statements together. The answer is C. So that's what we needed. We needed to know, the first part tells us that it falls in, uh, there are in two possible ranges, uh, in the positive range and the negative range. That was not enough. Second part tells us that it's a negative. That by itself is not enough. But when we put them together, then we know it's, it's false. it is a negative, so it must be in this range. If it's in this range, then the value of the x in the box would always be zero. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.